Hello, and welcome back to the Art of Software Development. Today, we're going to be talking about pi. Mm, pi. No, not that pi, the number pi. Pi is probably the most famous mathematical constant there is, and it's interesting because it's transcendental. In other words, the digits go on forever without repeating. So how do we get those digits? Well, we don't have a closed form solution for them, so we have to calculate them. In this video, I'm going to show you one way to do that, and it's pretty simple and straightforward. So what is pi, and how do we calculate it? Well, there are two ways you've probably seen pi introduced. The first is circumference. If you have a circle of radius r, its circumference is 2 pi r. The circumference is the distance you travel if you walk around the circle. There's a way to calculate pi based on the circumference discovered by Archimedes. And there's another way you may have seen pi introduced. If you have a circle of radius r, then its area is pi r squared. The area is the amount of paint you need to fill the circle. There's also a method involving areas and calculus due to Newton. And there's another way. There are certain infinite sums that equal pi or something related to pi. The one here is due to Euler, but there are others due to Ramanujan and other mathematicians, and there are ways to calculate pi based on these sums. In this video, we'll cover Archimedes' calculation. In later videos, I'll cover some of the others. We're going to do our calculations in Microsoft Excel, and we're not going to do anything really sophisticated. We're just going to use plus and minus and times and divide and square root. And that's as complicated as this calculation gets. And for the derivation of like how we get all these formulas, I could just give you the formula, but that's sort of unsatisfying. So I'm going to show you where it comes from. And I'll use a really little bit of algebra and a really little bit of geometry, but not much of either. So if you have a junior high or so math background, you should be able to follow. All right, so here's the plan for how we'll do the calculation. Let's just pick r equals 1 half. That will simplify because then the circumference just becomes pi. And let's draw a hexagon inside the circle. And the perimeter of that is less than pi. And then we'll draw a hexagon outside the circle, the circumscribed hexagon. That perimeter is greater than pi. And so a hexagon is the case for n equals 6. But we can change to n equals 12, draw a 12-sided shape on the inside and the outside. And then we can switch to n equals 24 and draw a 24-sided shape on the inside and the outside. And our bounds will always hold. As we increase n, they'll get closer and closer to each other, so we'll get a better and better approximation of pi. So let's just understand the setup here. Uh, I'm going to count the number of sides. So for the hexagon, that would be 6. And then what we're going to do is calculate the value of the perimeter for the inscribed hexagon and for the circumscribed, and pi will be between those two. And then we'll do 12, and then we'll do 24, and then we'll keep going like that. We'll always double each time. And uh, in a second, I'll show you how I got these numbers. That we'll, we'll change these to be a formula, and then we'll put in some extra stuff in the middle here to support that formula. In a minute, we're going to get to formulas for the perimeters of the inscribed and circumscribed circles. And to do that, we need a little trigonometry. It's just a really little, but it's the core idea of trigonometry. Let's say we have a right triangle, a triangle where one of the angles is a right angle, and another angle is theta. And let's say the sides are a, b, and c. Then all the right triangles we can make with that same angle theta are similar to each other. So if we scale up one side by a certain amount, we scale up the other sides by the same amount. So the actual values of the sides can change as we scale, but the ratios of the sides are constant for a given angle theta. Those ratios are so important that we give them special names, sine, cosine, and tangent. And if we name the sides based on their positions rather than just a, b, and c, hypotenuse is the long side across from the right angle, Adjacent is the side adjacent to the angle theta, and opposite is the side opposite the angle theta. Then we can write the ratios in terms of the positions. It's important to understand that sine, cosine, and tangent are functions of the angle theta, and that for a given theta, sine theta, cosine theta, and tangent theta are just numbers. We haven't talked about how you'd calculate those numbers, but we will in a while, at least in some cases, so we can get the inscribed and circumscribed perimeters. 
Now we're ready to calculate the perimeter of the inscribed shape. I've drawn a hexagon here, but we'll do the general case for an n-gon and what follows. Let's start by zooming in. And let's complete the triangle here by drawing a connecting line and labeling the angle theta. Over on the right, I'm going to make a scratch space for formulas. And let's start with theta. A full rotation around the circle is 360 degrees, and we're dividing that into n shapes. So theta is 360 over n. And the perimeter is just n times the length of one of the sides. Now let's bisect theta, split it in the middle, and look at half the angle and half the side. And we'll adjust our perimeter formula accordingly. Notice that we have a right angle here, so we can use one of our trigonometry formulas, specifically the sine formula. Putting in the opposite is half side, and the hypotenuse is a half. And now let's go ahead and move the half to the other side and plug that into the perimeter formula and cancel the two and the one half, and we get our final formula for the perimeter of the inscribed n-con. To get a numerical value for the perimeter of the inscribed hexagon, we have n equals 6, so 360 over n is 60, so we'll need the sine of 30 degrees. We'll come back to the full perimeter in a second, but in the meantime, let's calculate the sine of 30. And while we're at it, the cosine and tangent too. Let's start with an equilateral triangle. For convenience, we'll make all the side lengths 2, and of course all the angles are 60 degrees. Let's drop a perpendicular bisector. It splits the bottom into two equal parts of 1, and it splits the 60-degree angle at the top into two 30-degree angles. Let's focus only on the left-hand triangle. For right triangles, there's the Pythagorean theorem. I won't prove it in this video, but it's fairly easy to prove. There's even a Methologer video where he proves it in many, many different ways. Plugging in the numbers for A and C and solving gives us that B equals the square root of 3. And let's remember our trig definitions and plug in 1 for the opposite and square root of 3 for adjacent and 2 for the hypotenuse. And there we have it, values for sine, cosine, and tangent of 30 degrees. Okay, here we are back in Excel. In this little window over here, I've put together a cheat sheet of the formulas we've used so far, and let's start filling those into Excel. So we want to start with a hexagon that has n equals 6 sides. So theta is just 360 divided by n, and theta over 2 is just half of that. Okay, so now we need the sine of 30, cosine and tangent. Well, we have that from just now. So that's a half. This is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 2. And this is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 3. And then the perimeter of the inscribed one is n, which is that, times the sine, which is that. And that's the value of 3 that we had before. Okay, so now the next thing we need to do is get a formula for the circumscribed circle. Fortunately, since we've already done the inscribed one, this is a fairly easy thing to do. The perimeter for the circumscribed endon is very similar to the perimeter for the inscribed endon. First, we zoom in, draw sides to make a triangle, label the angles and the half side, Write our formulas. The perimeter equation is the same in terms of the half side. The difference is in our right triangle. Before, the hypotenuse was a half. Here's the adjacent side. So instead of the sine, we need to use the tangent. But everything else flows the same way. And there's the formula.
So back in Excel, let's go ahead and add that. And the formula is just n times the tangent. And that gives you the upper bound. And you can see that this is correct. Like 3 is less than pi, and pi is less than 3.46. So, so far, we're doing OK. Now, what we want to do is make higher n. So you might imagine doing 8 or 10 or something. But what we're actually going to do is we're always going to double it. So each time, we'll multiply by 2. And I'll do a handful of those. We can copy some of these formulas down. And so now we need to get sine and cosine and tangent. But let me be tricky here. So tangent is actually sine divided by cosine. So instead of putting in the number, I'm going to change it to a formula. So now all we need to do is figure out how to fill in sine and cosine as our angle gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Next up, we're going to get formulas for the sine and cosine for a row in terms of the sine and cosine of the previous row. If you're not interested in the derivation and want to skip ahead to where we've already got those formulas and we just use them, then here's the time code. So go ahead and skip to there. Just a quick note, we've seen sine and cosine in this form. For what follows, it'll make more sense to multiply by the hypotenuse and use them in this form instead. First, we're going to see what happens to the cosine when you add two angles. That may seem a little odd. What does that have to do with anything? But stick with me, and once we have that, we'll use it to finish our spreadsheet. So let's start by writing down the sine and cosine formulas in the multiplicative form. Now let's draw an angle A and an angle B and drop a perpendicular from the top to the bottom. Let's focus on the triangle generated with this new perpendicular. It has angle A plus B. And for simplicity, let's let the hypotenuse be 1. Now we can use the cosine formula and we get that the bottom side of this triangle is the cosine of A plus B. Let's label that. Let's add back the line between the two angles and drop a perpendicular from the top to that second line. We'll focus on the triangle formed with this perpendicular. Using our trig identity for cosine, we can label one of the sides. And this might seem weird, but remember that cosine b is just a number, so the label makes sense. While we're focused on that triangle, we'll do the same thing for sine. But we're not going to use that right now, so let's fade it out and we'll come back to it later. Let's drop a perpendicular from the vertex with the right angle and focus on the triangle that's formed when we add that side. Now we plug into the cosine identity and we get the bottom side of that triangle. So now we have to do a little geometry. If we go to the topmost point of the current triangle and draw a line that's parallel to the bottom line, then the angle formed by that line is equal to A. The two angles, A, are alternate interior angles. It's fairly easy to prove they're equal. If we now look at the topmost right angle, the sum of its subangles is 90, and the one subangle is A, so the other must be 90 minus A. The little triangle at the top is also a right triangle, and so its missing angle must be A. Now remember when we calculated the sine before and didn't use it? It's time to bring it back. Now we can use the sine identity on the topmost triangle, and we get that the opposite side is sine A sine B. Which side is the opposite side? Well, it's this one, which is part of this rectangle here. So the bottom side is the same length. Let's label that. And now we have all the pieces, so let's just write an equation that the sum of the parts equals the whole and rearrange to get a formula for cosine of a plus b. Let's copy over that formula and manipulate it algebraically. First, let's replace a with theta, and then b with theta, and simplify.
This is called the double angle formula for cosine. Let's put it aside for a bit. Let's bring back our friend, the Pythagorean theorem, and replace a, b, and c with their trig names, dividing through by the hypotenuse squared, and using the names of trig identities, we get the Pythagorean theorem in trigonometric form, which we can add to our double angle formula. Now let's make two identical copies of the formulas. We're going to rearrange the Pythagorean theorem. On the left, we'll solve for sine squared, and on the right, for cosine squared. Now plug that into the double angle formula and simplify. Finally, let's solve for the theta terms, not the two theta terms. And there we have our half angle formulas. This brings us back to Excel. The half angle formulas that we have let us get one row in terms of the row above that. So let's go ahead and fill in the one for sine first. Square root of the quantity 1 minus, okay, the cosine is this one, and divide by 2. And this one will be the square root of the quantity 1 plus the cosine divided by 2. And tangent, we have the formula. It's just sine over cosine. And so we'll cop. So let's copy this down. And now we have a better approximation for pi. And now with our formulas, we can just copy down row by row. And you can see each round you're getting closer and closer to pi. 3.14. And I'm just going to go for broke now. And so that's how with a handful of fairly simple formulas you can calculate pi. Let's go ahead and copy down some more. And you can see we're getting a better and better approximation. And then something interesting happens if we copy down even more. We start getting junk, and it looks like right around here is where we start getting junk. You can see that everything was closing in, and then it started messing up. That's not a problem with what we're doing, that's a problem with numerical limits on how small numbers can be in floating point numbers. I'll make another video at some point where I talk about floating point numbers, but if you wanted to get more digits of pi using this method, you could write a Python program or something like that. Anyhow, I'll just go ahead and delete the problematic ones, and I'll leave it here. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And please like and subscribe and leave me a comment and let me know what you think about this and what other topics you'd like to see.